Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hey, thanks listeners for joining me once again. This is going to be a really interesting topic. I know you're going to love to hear more about. With me is David Moss from Inmune Bio. We're going to be talking about their novel treatment approach that they are working on researching right now, which, you know, since there are really no good treatments right now, it's always nice to hear about something that might be coming along. So thanks for joining me, David. You're certainly welcome. And thank you for having me, Jennifer. So before we hit record, you were telling me that your father passed away from Alzheimer's. So why don't we start with your personal background and how it's obviously fueling your passion for what you're doing currently? Yeah. So, you know, like like you, I had a, a you know a parent and a father that I I saw a gradual decline over a long period of time, and it was really difficult because he was a strong man. He was the leader of the family. He obviously was somebody who made me who I am today. And as you probably experienced, and you know certainly the millions of people that take care of um, people with dementia, you really become involved in the disease. And I like to say that Alzheimer's is a family disease. It's not an individual disease. It affects the whole family. And obviously I went through the burden of having to take care of my father, obviously not being very uh, geographically close with him and all the complications that, is, that, that, that come with that. And, and unfortunately, um, you know, he passed away uh, as a result of the disease uh, and, um, you know, it kind of set me on a mission to, like you, no different than you about how can we find better solutions to treat Alzheimer's disease? So in, boy, 2015, I got together with some very good friends. One is a transplant surgeon, and one is a, a very well-known professor. And we founded a company, which is uh, Immune Bio that you mentioned. And our whole mission was really to develop novel immunotherapies using the immune system is what immunotherapies around what's called the innate immune system. And that's how we got involved to try and figure out novel solutions for for dementia. And so nobody else is trying to use our own built-in immunity to deal with this disease. I find that a little surprising. Well, think, think about it. No, it's 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 actually not surprising. I mean, uh, if you look at the history of Alzheimer's disease, you know, think about your mother. When you first knew there was something that potentially might be wrong, you most likely went to see a neurologist. You didn't go to see an immunologist. You went to see a neurologist, right? You never really thought about the immune system of the brain. And in fact, if you look at the history of drug development in Alzheimer's, you know, especially it's been very highly focused on amyloid, plaques, and tau's. And those are neurologic type targets, right? We used to not even think that the brain had much of an immune system. We used to think that the brain was so-called what they called immune privileged. It had this blood brain barrier and therefore it saved, it kept itself separate from the body's immune system. So we never looked at it from an immunologic standpoint until maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, we started to realize the brain had its immune system. In fact, probably half the cells in the brain are what we call immunologically active. They do really important things to the brain. And so if you think about how long it takes to develop drugs, like these amyloid drugs, for example, that just recently got approved, you know, it's taken a lot of money. It's taken 15 plus years to develop it. And when you add the R&D that goes in to create the drug, which is probably another five, six, seven, eight years, you know, they're, they're doing research back in the time when they're looking at it from purely a neurologic standpoint. So it's not their fault. Right. Um, and and that's where I, the, let's call it 99 percent or 95 plus percent of the spending and research has been, because what we see in the clinic today is something that happened, you know, 10 years ago. So it's relatively new to approach, you know, dysfunction of the brain or brain diseases from an immunologic standpoint. Um, I like to say, you know, look at cancer. If we go back a long period of time. I don't know, 50 plus, 40, 50 years ago, we used to beat the immune system up. We used to think the immune system was part of the reason we got cancer. And now what do we do is we rev the immune system up. We make these, that's where the term immunotherapy came from. So our whole goal is to look at the immunology of the brain and see what can we do 
to make changes in the brain so the health of the brain gets better. And our belief is, is that if we do that, that the immune system of the brain will start to function normally. And when it does, the health of the brain gets better. And I can talk to you about, you know, more specifics of that later, but that's, that's what we're doing. We have clinical trials that are testing that. And, uh, you know, one of the things I like to say about, um, about um, people who are um, dealing with loved ones that have dementia, is, you know, one of the best things that they can do for if, you know, to contribute to um, the success of, of new development is to really consider clinical trials. You know, if you think about the, the Adhelm that you mentioned or the Lacanumab, the anti-amyloid drugs, those drugs wouldn't potentially be in the market today if it wasn't for all the patients that went through and did those clinical trials. And we really owe a lot of gratitude to people who enroll themselves in clinical trials because that furthers the whole commitment for all of us. And, hey, um, and so that's what we're in the process of doing. Yeah. You can't test effectiveness on mice if you're going to no. use it on humans. And <laughs> that's right. Four legs are different than two, right? Generally, they can run yeah. faster. <laughs> yeah, they can, that's right. They can my dog. I met a gal when I was back in D.C. Um, she's in a clinical trial for like the third drug in the Anumab series or however you want to call that. It starts with a D, so like Decanumab oh, or something. Oh, no, no, Don, Doninumab, the, the Eli okay. Lilly drug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's another anti-amyloid drug. So that was interesting, you know, because I hadn't even heard of that one. And I know people that have been in both the aducanumab and the lecanumab. Man, why do they come up with such hard names? Yeah, yeah, well. It, it, Are those Latin or something? They're just no, hard to... they, well, they, they all, like, for example, MAB at the end of all of those, they mean monoclonal antibodies. So they kind of refer from a scientific standpoint what they are. Um, so daninamab, lecanamab, aducanamab, uh, or um, they're all monoclonals. So they all do this. They all they really all do the same thing. They're all kind of identical. They all uh, work the same way. The results are very similar. So um, you know th they're really the same drug. So they're just trying to make them better each um, version, um, so to speak. No, they're just different companies. You know, one yeah. is uh, one is Eastside Eastside Biogen, one is Eli Lilly, and uh, well, well, two of them are are Eastside and, and Biogen, and one is Eli Lilly, and there'll be a bunch down the road. So, but the, it's all the same. The, I think the message here is that that's all the same approach. Right? That's mm -hmm. really the neurologic approach of let's remove these plaques, these amyloids, and then let's see what happens. And we know, you know that. It doesn't, it, it alters the course of the decline by about 30%, but unfortunately you still significant. decline. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's definitely significant, but you still decline. So the end result is, you know, uh, it's about a four to six month difference in, in, in time, which is, it's good, but it's not great. I mean, the ultimate goal here would be to stop the decline, right? Stop the decline in its tracks. Yeah, definitely. I think that if you can stop if you can arrest the decline, the cognitive decline, um, and catch the disease early, like anything, if you catch a disease early and you can stop the progression of the disease, then you alter that course. And that's really what our goal is. Um, you know, um, but like we were talking about earlier, you know, the first drugs, the very first drugs that are disease modifying in any disease, whether it was cancer or, 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 um, dementia, they're usually not great, right? But the second get better than the first and the third get better than the second and on and on, we build on that. So it's a great first step, uh, but we can do better. Agreed. It'd be nice if we could hurry it up. Not that it would do you or I any good <laughs> because our parents are gone, but you know, God forbid either one of us has any form of dementia. You know, it'd be nice, it'd be nice if we hurry this up. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more, but clinical trials are costly, and unfortunately, there's uh, they take time. There's a regulatory burden that that companies have to go through, and uh, you know the best way to speed it up, frankly, is is to get people enrolled in clinical trials. Um, that's really the best the best thing, and it, and it gives them hope too, because um, you know if they end up in a successful clinical trial, um, they can be amongst the first. Uh, to, to potentially be part of, of, of the therapy. And, and obviously the therapy is paid for, so they have no cost associated with it. Yeah, that's always a benefit. Yeah. So I'm a little curious, and I hope you can answer this question. So we have brain cells that are basically um, 
their immune cells, essentially. That's not quite the right phrase. Do we know what those are doing? Are they, would they, would they be in responsible for clearing out the plaques and amyloids and all that stuff? Or do we not know that yet? So it's an excellent, excellent question. And um, it's fascinating. So I'm going to tell you something that's probably going to be a little bit shocking to you. Okay. I like shocking. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm going to say that Alzheimer's dementia is a relatively simple disease. You know, you've probably never heard anybody say that. No, I don't think I have. (laughs) There's, yeah, there's two, if you think about it, there's really two primary things that happen in dementia. And I say dementia because, because uh, Alzheimer's is very specific to amyloid, right? Frankly, Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of people that die with normal cognition that have a lot of amyloid in their brain. Okay. I've heard that. Yeah. So amyloid is not, is not a hundred percent um related or correlated with um uh, cognitive decline so i'm going to say dementia including alzheimer's if you don't mind um so there's two things there's two primary things that happen right you have what are called neurons in your brain and neurons store the memory that's the memory of for example your mother's name it's sitting in a neuron if that neuron dies that memory is lost right It's lost forever. And the only way you get that back is if you put that memory in another neuron, you retrain yourself, okay? A mathematical formula, a birth date, whatever. It sits in a neuron. Now, that memory sits in a neuron, but you have to recall it. So the second thing is there's what are called synapses, these fiber tracks of synapses. They call white matter in the brain. So the gray matter is where the neurons sit, and the white matter is where the synapses are. And so when you recall that memory, like you recall the birth date or you recall my name, it goes, it comes out of a neuron and it travels through uh, synapses and then you can, it tells your mouth to say it and you use motor function and away it goes, right? So cognitive decline has two things that occur. You have synaptic, what they call it synaptic pruning or synaptic dysfunction. The synapses pull away. And so the memory might be there, but you can't recall it. You know, saying, I, I can remember that. What is it? I know it's there, but I can't recall it, right? That's more like synaptic dysfunction. And then let's say an hour later or the next day, you know, someone with dementia then remembers it. So their neuron isn't gone in that sense, but the synaptic dysfunction, the wires are kind of broken, if you will. And then if the neuron dies, which is very late, much later in the disease, you know, once your neuron's gone, then you really, then it's gone forever, right? And that's when people stop recalling names and, you know, they don't recognize people and so on to that sort. So the immune cells of the brain Let's, we'll call them, you know, there's, a, there's a number of them, like uh, astroglial cells, uh, microglial cells, ast- uh, oligodendrocytes, you don't have to worry about that. Let's just say the glial cells or the immune cells. Their job is to take care of the synapses, and their job is to take care of the neurons. So when the immune s- system is healthy of the brain, they're removing debris, okay? And they're repairing the synapses, they're constantly repairing synapses. <laughs> and they're constantly taking care of the neurons. And so that's a healthy immune system, you know. And when something happens that causes dysfunction of the immune system, they stop doing their job. They kind of change from angels to assassins, right? <laughs> they get lazy. They don't remove debris. The synapses start to disintegrate. And the neurons start to die. And you get this decline, right? You get this cell death and decline. And so if you can fix that those glial cells and those immune cells of the brain, our belief is, and kind of what we've shown in our early trials, is that the immune cells go back to work. You know, they start to repair synapses, start to repair repair neurons. So in the case of like the um, amyloid that you asked at the very beginning, those don't really have anything to do with killing neurons or synapses. They are a contributor to it. But they're not directly as a result. And, you know, we kind of know that if you remove amyloid, you still end up declining, right? Mm -hmm. We also also know that people die with amyloid in their brain and have no cognitive dysfunction whatsoever. And they don't really know scientifically what amyloid does to the brain. So our view is is that it's kind of a sidecar player. You know, it's more of like... uh, you know, it might cause a little bit of the pathology of dysfunction, but it's not the main culprit. And so our, our goal is let's look directly at these immune cells. And if we can get them functional again, then, uh, then they'll do their job and 
the synapses get healthy and the neurons stay healthy and you stop that. And that's how you can stop and flatline this cognitive dysfunction. So anybody who's drug, in our view, this is our personal view, that doesn't directly affect synapses or neurons is probably going to have a difficult time in the business. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I'm picturing these little, these immune cells the way you described them, I got a visual picture of like road workers. I lived in a town where they would, there was always road work. Rip up the road, yeah, repave yeah. the road. Rip up the road, repave the road. Mm -hmm. It was like job security. So I was like picturing, you know, we all drive by road construction or something. And there's like one guy in a hole and four guys watching him. So that's, kind of the, that was the visualization that I got. Yeah. But yeah. I, well, you're, you're not too far. I mean, uh, you know, if those workers show up on time and they work quickly and diligently, you know, then the road's functional. Think of the road as like the synapse, the synapses, mm -hmm. you know, where, you know, you've ordered something on a, uh, on a, on a truck and it's going to travel to your house. Well, if the road's dysfunctional, it doesn't get to your house, right? Well, that's your mm -hmm. synapse, your synaptic pathway, your, your pat, your fiber track. You know, if, if the workers are repairing the road, then it gets there. But if they sit around and just goof off, <laughs> uh, the, they're like the immune cells of the brain. They, the, the road gets more dysfunctional. It closes, shuts down, and guess what? The delivery never makes it to your house. So and that's 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 good point. Good analogy. It's so, <clears throat> just what popped into my head. Do we yeah. know what causes like what the general cause of the immune cells to basically become lazy? We do. Because there's there's we so do. many you know other like. I, in my previous career as a photographer, I had a client who had a very seriously autistic son. And I'm thinking, there's got to be some correlation between what's going on with people with autism and people with dementia. It's not the same. I don't think autistic people's brains are dying, but I don't know. I just always feel like there's some correlation. And I don't know, maybe. There, no, you're not wrong. I mean, you know, there's actually a correlation between um, almost a lot of brain health. So you can add in you know, autism, uh, depression, uh, ALS, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, FTD, um, you mentioned vascular dementia, uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. These all have a common pathology that can drive the dysfunction. So, um, you know, it really just depends how it manifests in the brain, which determines kind of what disease you might, uh, what might drive. But brain health is driven by something called chronic inflammation. Very and familiar it, with that one. <laughs> Not yeah, personally. Well, <laughs> well, look, think of like um, somebody who plays football or a boxer that gets banged in the head a lot. They, that's called traumatic brain injury or, or CTE. Those people, their brain's shaking around, you know, it's like jello shaking around in there. And they are much more susceptible to uh, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and brain disease. Why? Because they're increasing chronic inflammation. Think about, um, you know, uh, somebody who smokes a lot, somebody who is overweight and doesn't exercise and eats a poor diet. They're much more susceptible to chronic inflammation. But the biggest driver of chronic inflammation, the vast majority of it, comes from, you want to take a guess? What we eat? No, it comes from oh. age. It comes from oh. age. Oh, you know? I'm, so, I'm, I, for, I forget about that one because I plan on yeah. living. My paternal grandmother lived to 103 with. Good for her. Yeah. She was mostly blind from glaucoma. And then at about 101, she got really hard of hearing, which definitely doesn't do nice things to your brain. But for the most part, you know, she got to 100 years old, like pretty, pretty much intact. Mentally, she was still sharp. So that's my goal because I've, I've yeah. inherited I've inherited genes from that side of the family that are those are good genes. Well, I hope I got those because I got the fat gene from that side of the family. <laughs> well, <laughs> and that's a know, constant so, battle. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna make this up, but the say seventy percent is age, right? And we can't intervene with age, unfortunately. Well, except um, for to die. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, that's right. You stop it at that point. That's true. Um, but that's the one other 30, cure. Yeah, that's one cure. 
Uh, so eight, let's call it age and genetics, right? And then the other 30% is lifestyle, right? That's smoking, diabetes, not exercising, obesity, uh, living next to a factory that has a lot of pollutants. It's all those things, right? And, uh, and that just piles on top of age and genetics. And uh, what happens is that, you know, disease... More than 50% of deaths can be attributable to some chronic inflammatory disease, for example. So we know that chronic inflammation, wherever you have it in your body, if it's in your heart, if it's in your liver, if it's in your brain, you or kidney or whatever it is, you have cell death. Chronic inflammation equals cell death, right? It causes cell death. And so if you can get rid of the chronic inflammation, then it helps. So eating right and exercising is great. Definitely a good part of it. It's something that we can all do. Hard to do, but something we can all do. Yeah. Um, the motivation can be challenging sometimes. It can be challenging. It's a lifestyle change, right? It's hard sometimes to do a lifestyle change. But still, that's only 30% of it. Because we all know people, for example, that smoked a lot, like George Burns and lived to be 100 something and never worried, you know, never worried about lung cancer, but most people are going to get lung cancer. We all know there's always outliers, right? But by and large, you know, age and poor lifestyle drive disease, any kind of disease, right? So if we can have a drug, which is the picture in the background of, of what I have here, actually, that can reduce inflammation, chronic inflammation, or neuroinflammation. Neuroinflammation is just chronic inflammation in the brain. If we can reduce chronic inflammation without immunosuppression, because most drugs that reduce chronic inflammation biologically also immunosuppress. And you know that's a trade-off because you get rid of immunosuppression, but then you, you suppress the immune cells to do their job. You still keep them sleepy, right? Mm -hmm. But if we can get rid of the neuroinflammation and keep and you know elevate or motivate the immune cells, they go back to work even in an elderly person is what we've seen. And that's what we're trying to do. And I think that if we're able to do that in the brain, boy, we'll make a, we'll, we'll, we'll change the, we'll change the whole industry. We'll change the way people think about Alzheimer's. We'll change the research around Alzheimer's and, you know, in, in, and boy, I wish, and I hope, and I'm working really hard to try and do it. We hope we can really make a difference to families, you know, that suffer from, uh, um, dementias and and uh and that's our goal so that's how we're trying to do it so really it's it's kind of like what we did with cancer 30 40 years ago with with immunotherapy and now we're doing it to 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 brain diseases we're doing it to um um you know we're gonna start in alzheimer's because we got money from the alzheimer's association to start thank you alzheimer's <laughs> association but we're going to go to treatment resistant depression we're going to go to parkinson's we're going to go to multiple sclerosis we're going to als and on down the line. And, and one thing I should say is that, like any disease, you have to catch it early. Mm -hmm. If you catch cancer late, it's difficult. If you catch it early, you have a chance to change the course of the disease. Alzheimer's is no different. If you catch it late, it's, it's kind of too late. If you catch hey, it early. You can't resurrect dead brain cells. Eggs, you, you took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> it, we're not, well, there's, it, it, I don't remember which company it is, but somebody's very close to having a blood test. For yeah. testing for Alzheimer's. Yep. And right now, what I'm seeing is a lot of people like myself who have been who, been a caregiver or are a caregiver. They're like, I don't want to know. And it's like, I get it. Like, I wouldn't really want to know either. But I kind of don't like that kind of surprise. So I'm, I would probably take the blood test because then you can plan ahead. You can have the conversations well, ab that all, you know, what all the conversations I talk about on this show, you could have them. Instead of what we went through, like my dad passed away, there was never a conversation on what would happen with my mother if he went first. And he had a lot of chronic illnesses. So that was an important conversation we missed. I'm hoping, you know, if there's a better treatment option and a better early detection option, that maybe they'll, people will be less resistant because that's, that's well, obviously going to be a hurdle to climb. I'll make a bet with you. Okay. <laughs> I bet you those people who are resistant to testing would go in tomorrow and get tested if they knew there was a drug that would help them. I'm sure. If there well, was an easy drug to take that would stop their decline, I bet you you were going to test a lot more and will and and there will be a lot of people because you know, think about it, if you know that you've got uh, a pain or an ache, 
you don't just sit there. You go in because you know you can get it treated, right? So we go to the doctor when we know there's a solution. But the funny thing is with Alzheimer's, dementia, we, I, you don't want to know. And I, I get it. You don't want to know because what am I going to do? Yeah. What am I going to do afterwards? There's no treatment for it, you know? So, but if there's an easy treatment that literally makes a difference in the disease, then people are going to go in to get tested because they want to, they want the drug. And the only way they get the drug is to show that they have the disease. So, you know, I, I, I like to say, you know, we complain about the price of Alzheimer's drugs, but frankly, you know, I always say, what would you pay to save your brain? It's like the most important organ in your body or one of the most important. This is arguably the most important part, you know, organ in your body. What would you pay to save your brain? I mean, why is it any different than cancer drugs? I mean, we pay huge numbers for cancer drugs to live six months longer, 12 months longer, 18 months or, or, or maybe 10 years longer. If we could live, if we, if we could live. If we had all, if I had Alzheimer's and I could live to die from some other disease, I'd, I'd be happy to pay a similar price. Now, the problem is there's a lot of people with Alzheimer's disease and you know, how do you afford it? But, you know, the other problem is, is that we're paying huge numbers for it. The burden is gigantic. You know, it's like between one and two percent of U.S. GDP is the direct and indirect cost, which I know it's ginormous. What and, do you think that do you think that that percentage is probably an undercount? Because oh, I'm do. on I'm on the soapbox that if corporations and to some extent our government, but mostly corporations in this country, if they knew what it was already costing them, you know, in you know, in people, you know, long time employees that have to retire early. So you've got, you know, loss of institutional knowledge, people that have to go from full time to part time. So now you've got to find somebody to cover the other half of their job or people that have to leave the, you know, work all together. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. The stress, the depression, you know, the, 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 the family loss, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm, I'm looking, I have up here on, on, you know, the economic cost of Alzheimer's disease that was given to Congress in July of 2022. And they said, you know, the, U.S. economy estimates are $321 billion in 2022, and what you were talking about, the unpaid caregiving cost is another $271 billion. So that's, uh, you know, almost $600 billion right there. And that doesn't include, you know, the stress, the depression, that, that's everything else. So, you know, if it's, call it a five, let's round it down significantly to a $500 billion a number. And we Just know a big that, number. <laughs> yeah, we know U.S. GDP last year was 23 trillion. You know, that's close to 2% of U.S. GDP. And that's a giant, that's a huge, huge drag. If you could mm -hmm. do something where the, 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 you could stop the cognitive decline early, they can still take care of themselves. They can cook, they can dress, they can, you know, go out on a walk. They don't have to do it on their own. They don't need a full-time person or a part-time person. They don't need assisted living, at least until later. And then it's something else that drives these. I mean, that's a big, big, big disease. That's a huge, 
savings, right? Mm -hmm. So, so um, I mean, look, you and I probably experienced the part of when you move your loved one into a care facility. I mean, how much is that on a monthly basis alone? It's a big number. I just figured so, it out. So there's been a, there was a conversation close to tax day on um, Instagram about what people were spending out of pocket for basically assisted caregiving. So like hiring a caregiver so you could continue to work your job while you, you know, one particular person comes to mind, she works from home um, and she has a, a high, you know, um, high level job, but she, you know, she spent like over $18,000 for, I think it was a year and it was like four hours a day, four days a week. Yeah. And, and then other people chimed in. One gal was close to 50,000 was nine months. Yeah. Um, and then, so I'm like, okay, I'm going to chime in because while my dad was on hospice, we had to have 24 hour caregivers in their home and it was over $700 a day, which was in 2017. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. It was like, you know, just open the bank account and let the money just flood right out. Yeah, I mean, and, 700 a day, 10 days, that's 7,000 every 10 days. So. Yeah, it was like basically, and I yeah. I had the numbers, it was either 43 or I think it was like $43,000 in like two and a half months. It was just like it's staggering. Incredible. Yeah. Some people don't even make that in a year. I and know. so then I'm like, okay, well, my mom was in memory care for 36 months from March 17 to March 20. I'm not sure if that's 36 or 37 months, but I calculated it 36 months at $5,600 a month was over $200,000. It was like a <laughs> choke. Was just like, well, I think, was I, think, I think those are examples that, yeah, they're probably undercounting it. Right. So, you know, so if you had a drug and you paid 26,000, 30,000 a year, a year, and it kept that cost from occurring or it significantly reduced that burden. It's like a godsend. You're spending five, six, seven, eight, ten thousand dollars a month, and you can avoid that. It's a big deal. It's a big difference. So anyway, I think one of the things we really need to look at, you know, is if biologic intervention, you know, versus what's the cost of without that, assuming that you make a a, a difference in in cognitive decline. So you know, I I, uh, I I personally don't have any kind of a problem with the way the lecanemab drug is priced. Um, you know, it's the first. I, I, I think that uh, even though it reduces the decline, it still makes a difference. I think they've priced it actually quite modestly. Uh, I know people get upset about that, but when you look at the long-term burden and if it slows that decline, it's I think it's a fair price. I don't think I know what lecanemab's price is, but I know you don't have to be on it for very long either. It's uh, they're going to charge lecanemab. Is what mm -hmm. they, they're going to charge about twenty six thousand a year. Okay, so but you don't even have to be on it for a year, from my understanding. Well, the 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 so like in donimab, which is the Lily drug, you're right. Where they say once your amyloid is gone, there's no need to be on the drug. And I think that they're going to do the same with Lecambi, because there's no point in taking the drug if you don't have amyloid in the brain anymore. And then <laughs> maybe true. after a few years it comes back, then you go on the drug again, and then you stop. So, um, well, it remains to be seen, right? So if you need to be on it, cause the, what I heard when I was back in DC fighting for coverage for the Kemby and net, the other one, um, the two that are approved was, you know, for Lakembi, you only had to do it for three to six months. So let's just say six months, that's $13,000 a year. So that's what, $1,100 a month. That really, you know, you're right. That isn't out, that outrageous. And then you go off of it for a couple of years. I mean, eleven hundred dollars a month is a lot cheaper than fifty six hundred or seven hundred dollars a day. Math is not usually my thing unless there's dollar signs in front of well, it. Well, you're close. I think you're right. You know, I, I, I uh, so the drug that I, I believe it's going to get approved worldwide. It's the Lakembi. I don't think Ad Adahelm will not, but I, I really do believe Lakembi will. So we'll wait and see. We still have to wait till about July to mm -hmm. find out. But I, you know, the the, the group at Esai ran the proper trial, it's rock solid data. They clearly make a difference in the in the decline. Unfortunately, it's still a decline. And, um, you know, but they're the first. And, um, you know, hopefully we can do better. I agree. If you can slow the decline, especially in the people that get Alzheimer's or other dementias in older age. Now, my mom, 
my mom died at 77, so I don't think she technically got to older age. And my, I'm thinking in the 80s and 90s, if you slow the decline enough, you'll probably die from old age before you die from Alzheimer's. And that's not a horrible thing. <laughs> It's no, that's exactly horrible. Right. No, no, it's not. I mean, uh, look, we're all, unfortunately, we're all biologic beings. And, and at some point we, we move on, um, you know, things just give out. But uh, I would, you know, if, uh, that's our goal, right? If we can completely arrest decline, cognitive decline, that they end up dying from some other complication, you know, some other disease, some other old age issue or, or, or health complication, not, not from Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, I think other diseases or just old age is a better. I'd choose that before Alzheimer's any day, just because. Oh, you know, I know. I'm sure you. I don't know if you experienced it, but you know, not being able to feed yourself and all of that stuff, becoming bed bound. I mean, it's like, really, we we avoided. My mom was ambulatory until she fell and broke her leg, March eighth of twenty, and that was the last straw for her body. And she had started having trouble uh, feeding herself, but not always. It was. It was definitely a precursor to her brain forgetting how to to do the movements to feed herself and recognize the food on the plate and all those things. So we got to skip, for the most part, the really, really ugly end. But I've seen it in guests and other caregivers that I know, and it's just, it's like, my goal with my mom was to give her as much quality of life and joy as possible without prolonging dying from Alzheimer's. And that's a really very fine line high up in the air to... to travel it's like uh and it's obviously well, very personal for yeah. everybody everybody's choice will be different no i mean good for you i think that's the right thing to do that's that's not too different than what i did with my dad you know there comes a quality of life issue that gets so bad that uh you know it's almost better for them to move on but you know with alzheimer's you're right it's it's you lose them twice right you lose their mm -hmm. soul first and then you lose them on passing and um and that soul part is really difficult you know, to be around. It's, it's tough. Yeah. Cause she started showing signs of cognitive problems and they were very easy to ignore when I was in my early thirties. So I started losing my mom at the same time. I, um, I had all my grandparents until I was 32. So I was like really blessed, <laughs> but that's when, you know, my grandmother was getting really bad. Mom was starting to show very concerning signs of something going on. And when I think back on it, it's like, you know, I really didn't have my mom in the last 20 years of my life because she thought I was her best friend, which was fine. I lost a tremendous amount of weight. So I was 99% certain she didn't recognize this person that was in front of her as her daughter because I'd been really, really overweight for 20 years. So that was kind of a no brainer. It's like, I barely recognize the person in the mirror. How do I expect my mother to put two and two together and get four? And then I, I confirmed it when I, I told her that I was there to visit her. It was a special day. And the memory care was having um, a family, um, they were calling it a harvest, harvest, not brunch, but it was, a, it was a lot of food for Thanksgiving. And my birthday happens to be before Thanksgiving. So I said, well, you know, they're having a party today. And, you know, it's a special day. And I reminded her what day it was. And I'm like, do you know why November 17th is special? And she's like, nope. And I said, well, it's my birthday. And she's oh, really? And I'm like, yeah, this is, I'm. Was nice. I'm pretty sure she does not remember who I am. Yeah, so it was yeah. not the painful realization that other people had. But man, there's just times, and you probably experience this, where it's like, man, I really wish I could ask my mom, like, anything. Like, can you help? My mom was a great seamstress. Can you help me alter this shirt because it's a little big in certain places and fits great in others? Or advice on raising the kid or what? It's like, ugh. Yeah, it's terrible. No, it is. It is. Well... You know, it's one of the reasons why you have a mission and you, you've done your podcast, right? It's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I, ha I have a mission along with our team of trying to solve this damn disease, right? And, you know, it's just you get very passionate about it when it affects you. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that, you know, from a country standpoint, um, you know, it's affected a lot of people. But when you're one of the primary caregivers and you're actually physically and mentally involved in the day-to-day -day care or having to, to, to organize it, pay for it, do it yourself, whatever it is, um, you really understand how you need more support. You really understand how the government and society needs to throw in more resources at trying to solve this problem or, uh, and provide various supports. 
you understand how, for example, I think the FDA needs to move quicker in, in, in um, supporting programs that might make a change in this disease. Also, the NIH in terms of funding. I think that, you know, I encourage families to really look for clinical trials because that moves the whole thing forward for everybody. It also gives them potential of hope. So, you know, all this is a big community. If we can really throw our support behind um, novel approaches and the existing approaches, we'll figure out a solution. I'm confident of that, right? Um, you know, it's we're not far off. I really don't think we're far off in trying to really alter um, this degenerative process. And if we do that, then, you know, boy, think about the burden we solve, you know, for our children or for our grandchildren and, and, and their kids in the future by, you know, I won't necessarily say eradicating this disease, but stopping this disease, you know, from really becoming, um, as bad as it is today. It's kind of like going, it would be going into remission when you yeah. go through cancer treatments You've had cancer. They always, I guess, assume uh, cancer is not something we dealt with in my family on either sides. We had we have brain problems on my maternal side and diabetes on the paternal side. But, you know, they always, once you're a cancer patient, you're always a cancer patient. You're either fighting the disease or you're or in remission. So I'm assuming that's kind of where you would end up with, with your drug. Yeah, I mean, that's a good way to think about it. I mean, there's a lot of cancer patients, for example, that if they didn't have these immunotherapies, they just didn't exist. They their cancer would their the the their cancer would um, return and they wouldn't be around. But immunotherapies, some of them they take it for the rest of their lives, and it keeps them alive. It keeps their disease in check. I had met uh, a woman or, last month. She's she's had stage four pancreatic cancer for six years. Yeah, before I mean, if she without immunotherapy or support, she it's rare to eat, last very long with that type of cancer. It's a very aggressive form of cancer. Yeah, she, she's but, you know, a little surprised she's still around. <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, look at like breast cancer, for example. You know, we've got, you know, from these drugs like Herceptin, and there's a new drug called Inher2 that just came out. They've made a remarkable difference for women with breast cancer. Just a remarkable difference. Checkpoint inhibitors for people like mel melanoma, you know, and, and um, probably another 10 types of cancer have, have made an absolute remarkable difference. And, you know, we haven't really looked at Alzheimer's the same way as we do in oncology, but we're starting to, and that's what we're doing. We think we're leading the pack with, with the way we're designing our trials and what we call biomarkers, which are ways to test along the way with trials. And, um, you know, we can do the same that we've done for cancer for the brain. And, and if we do that, um, we can dramatically slow the disease, maybe stop the disease in its tracks. And if we catch it early enough, you know, hopefully it's, it's, we haven't done too much damage and, and everything will be fine. That would be awesome. So where are you guys yeah. at in terms of your trial? So we have a, yeah, no, it's a good question. So we have a phase two trial. We did a phase one very successfully in, in Alzheimer's patients. It was, uh, the drug was safe and we saw a lot of MRI image changes of the white and gray matter of the brain. We saw a lot of um, what we'll call proteomics, but these are little things that show whether your, your brain is improving or, 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 or decreasing in health, and it was improving pretty dramatically. We saw neuroinflammation come down dramatically. And now what we're doing is we're running a phase two trial. It's enrolling patients in Australia and Canada and soon the U.S. So if you're a patient in Australia or you're a patient in Canada, I encourage you to look up our sites and try and enroll. Um, and, uh, and in the U S it should be open either towards the end of this year or early next year, I think towards the end of this year. And, um, and the idea here is, is that, um, not only will we measure, um, you know, obviously the neuroinformation, all the biomarkers of brain health, but we're going to really look closely at cognitive decline and it's a short trial. It's only six months and, um, you know, it's, it's what we call two to one randomization, meaning that. For every three people that get enrolled, two get the drug and one goes on placebo. But after six months, all patients can take the drug for an additional 12 months. So if you're in the placebo group, you only have to go six months to get the drug, which is really good because in a lot of trials, there are 18, most trials in Alzheimer's are 18 months. And if you're on placebo for 18 months, you kind of have progressed pretty far in your disease potentially. And then it's almost too late to, to, 
to, to do something. So yeah, that would um, be a bummer. It's kind of, yeah, but that's part of the, that's part of the trial. So it's the, the fact that it's a shorter trial, I think is that benefit. I mean, you could obviously go try another trial after six months. Um, but uh, yeah, and then the goal there is to measure, are we making a difference in car decline? And our goal is to try and flatline it, right? Instead of, you know, change. So if the slope looks like this, and then if you take Lakembi, it looks like that. And we're hoping to try and do this. So um, we'll see. Well, that sounds exciting. It's pretty Anyth exciting. Anything, any, it's like so, for, I know many people feel like I do. It's like they've been trying to clear the amyloids and the plaques and they've been going that, chasing that tiger for so long and it doesn't seem to be going very far. I guess it probably is, but it's so slow that it doesn't help. I mean, and basically if you've got Alzheimer's right now, you're probably SOL. Um, if you've been diagnosed with, um, mild cognitive impairment, you might be okay. You might be able to use the drugs, but you know, it's like, could we hurry up and come up with something? <laughs> so it's kind of nice to talk to somebody that's working on it and working on it in a different way. That's been my frustration is exactly what you expressed is that unfortunately, and I, you know, it's just, there's this whole big group of people that have been so focused from the neurologic aspect. They've been so headstrong on amyloid plaques tau and they've run lots of trials over a long period of time spending tens of billions of dollars and they haven't had much to show from it until recently and the recent stuff is okay it's not great so so I, it's time for a switch it's time to say hey amyloid is done we have the drugs for those now we know what they do because they've three different there's there's been three different tries and they all have very similar results so it's not like a fourth try is going to make that much of a difference doing the same thing so it's time to say hey let's let's stop doing the same thing over and over and over again we're done with tau tau's not work um we know what the results are with amyloid it's time to try new things and 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 um there's a few companies that are doing that but we need to do more of it and we need more money and support to do it yeah. well hopefully getting the word out you're the first person who's ever told me that they got money from the Alzheimer's Association, which as a person who's been a volunteer since 2018, that's very comforting to hear because sometimes I get really super frustrated with them because it's, you know, the way they have to structure their organization to get anything done. You know, everything's got to be bipartisan requests through our government, which, okay, I get, but sometimes it's like, really, why are we working with that person? Which so, you know, is not helpful. <laughs> uh, it's a little history there. Um, except we got money from what's called Park the Cloud, which is a subset of funds um, under the Alzheimer's Association umbrella that is specifically geared to try novel research. So basically outside of amyloid plaques, it's specifically geared to try new things. And they gave us a million bucks in a few years back, which allowed us, helped us fund the phase one clinical trial that we did. If it wasn't for them, it would have been difficult. We, we probably wouldn't have started actually in Alzheimer's disease. We probably would have started in like MS or something else. But we're glad they did that. It was the right choice. And um, yeah, no, it, 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 the best thing they can do, and, and this is my own personal opinion, is to continue to sponsor as many trials as they can. I mean, there's some political issues with that. And, you know, they've got a lot of stuff to deal with, but you know, where money, where, where rubber meets the road for patients is, is, you know, some drugs that are going to make a biological difference in the disease. And the only way to really do that is to try new scientific approaches. Well, so I have one last question. Do you ever see, do you foresee a future where maybe they use your drug and whatever Lakembi or whatever version they're on as a cocktail to clear the, the amyloids and halt the progression of the disease or they kind of mutually exclusive drugs? No, I think that's a really, really smart question. I do see I that future. I went to San Francisco State during the AIDS crisis, so I'm really familiar with, you know, the HIV drug cocktail. <laughs> Not well, personally, I mean, but... <laughs> so I, I said, I did start off and say that Alzheimer's is a simple disease. So pathologically, in terms of how the disease develops, it's simple. But it is a complex disease. And if you look at any complex disease, whether it's cancer or HIV, they don't use one drug. It's not a silver bullet, right? They use a cocktail of drugs. It's, it's what they call combination therapy. You know, you go in for cancer, it's chemo, surgery, radiation, and maybe multiple 
drugs that you get, most likely multiple drugs you get. It's not a single thing uh, or any of the above, right? And if you look at um, HIV, it's, you don't take one pill, take a cocktail of pills, right? So complex diseases require complex therapies. And so my guess is, yes, there will be that, plus maybe a lot of other things. Maybe, for example, in the future, you get rid of the neuroinflammation and maybe they can grow neurons back with some other drug, right? With, let's say, some stem cell type drugs. But you got to get rid of what's causing the disease in the first place, right? This chronic neuroinflammation, what's causing the cell death. So... Um, you know, removing the amyloid. Amyloid is, you know, it's like a byproduct that helps create neuroinflammation, for example, potentially. Um, so maybe getting rid of the amyloid and then getting the, getting the neuroinflammation in, get rid of the amyloid, and then keeping the neuroinflammation down, we know will prevent amyloid production. So in fact, we just had a press release today showing that TBI causes amyloid. And if you give our drug, it reduces, it, it reverts, it removes the amyloid and it reverts the disease state in mice, of course, for four legs. Um, so, uh, you know, it's really important to, to, to look at a complex disease with a multiple therapeutic approach. So you're absolutely right. Smart question. Awesome. So I like to tell people if I was half my age and had twice the scientific aptitude, I might go into brain research, but I am an artist and an entrepreneur. So Science stuff is not my thing. I probably well, my, would not be very useful. <laughs> my mother is an artist, and I can tell you genetically I didn't get her genes because I can barely draw a stick figure. I can't draw, but I'm a photographer, and during the pandemic, I um, took up the new hobby of making handmade greeting cards, which oh, cool. does not require a lot of artistic skill, and it does not require very much. There's not a big learning curve. You can make a pretty nice-looking card pretty much out of the gate. Oh, so. cool. Yeah, it's Neat. fun. I needed a project that, you know, like, who needs, you know, I like the um, acrylic pour painting, but holy God, is that a mess? And how many of those do you need? How many knitted, mm -hmm. crocheted things do you need? Like, I got photographs coming out my ears, digital images coming out my ears. I can wallpaper every room in my house with photos. So how many of those do I really need? So I had to, I had to come up with something that didn't clutter up the house. And this doesn't. So that was... Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a, that's a neat idea. Well, then you give yeah. them away too, and it makes people happy. It's like it's a really good hobby. Well, and also you've did you've done it yourself, right? So it, yeah, it's, it's, you, know, you hand on somebody a card that you've made yourself it goes a long way. It's funny now because like with my birthday and stuff, I get the whole sheepish. Well, it's just a store bought card. It's like that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'm not judging you because you haven't come to my house and whipped up something for me. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. But it's well, actually a really good. Um, it's like very zen because you just kind of, you know tune into just what you're doing and it's kind of meditative it's really cool but Super. this this has been awesome i have not had i mean i've had i i get to talk to lots of fascinating people but this one was not our original uh topic for those people who've gotten all the way to the end here but i think this one was definitely better and i think it's going to give people a lot of hope so you know there's walks, hope out there there's yeah hope that's out there. that's good to know because sometimes there's a lot of smart people working on it there really is that's good so. Not yeah. people like me, right? <laughs> no, I didn't say that. No, I mean, you're helping, right? You definitely are part of the community. That's what matters. So well, you're it dedicated. motivates me to work hard for my, and my, you know, the Alzheimer's walk team, which reminds me, I got to go ask the person I think will sponsor the walk team, which would be great. So well. That, that's my just, part. Here, the other thing too is, you know, you've got a very dedicated group of listeners. And if you weren't doing this, they wouldn't be able to hear our story either. So we do appreciate that. Well, I appreciate so. this and I uh, appreciate your passion for, you know, trying to fix this problem from your, you know, your skill set. And I'm working on it from my skill set. I'm always amazed that caregivers, you know, we've got artists and authors and people that do training. And there's just like, there's a lot of caregivers that turn around and, and try to, you know, lift people up instead of saying, wow, I'm glad that's done and just kind of go off into the sunset. <laughs> Well, it, it can definitely, you know, one thing that's great about America is that we do mobilize when we really get passionate about something. So there, the more passionate people we can get doing this, the better it'll be. I awesome. do thank you, Jennifer, for having me. I really do appreciate it and uh, certainly keep up the great work. Well, thank you. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>